It's an honor and a privilege to stand before you this morning. Our pastors, because of lack of leadership, we need more people for the Pathfinders. They're, they're out with our Pathfinders today, trying to uh, help the, that group. We need to, to pray that more people will stand up and help out with the Pathfinders because we've got a great Pathfinder Club right now. Now you've all heard the scripture verses this morning, so I think you know what we're going to be talking about. If you want to give me this, you've probably seen in there that the title of the sermon will, is Love Will Keep Us Together. Now most of you know that I wasn't an Adventist all my life, and when I was younger I used to listen to a lot of different types of music, and one of the prevailing topics in music is love. But if you go back and listen to the majority of those songs, the focus is physical attributes. I saw your face and I fell in love with you. One of the songs where I got the title for this was Love Will Keep Us Together. And the lady that sang that song professed that her love for her friend would keep them together. But that's not the type of love that keeps us together. And so this morning, we're going to explore the type of love that will keep us together. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, what a blessing it is to be in your house this morning. And I just pray that the words I speak are words from on high, that I will not get in the way of your Holy Spirit, and that the hearers will hear the particular messages in this message that you have prepared for them. So guide my thoughts, words, and actions this morning. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. My first scripture for you this morning is John, 1 John 4, verse 8. I want you to think about this verse. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Not loving, he is love. His very essence is love. And it says that if you do not love, you do not know him. The question is, do you want to know God, and do you want him to know you? This is a necessity, for we are warned that in, uh, back in Matthew 7, that they will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And he is speaking right then to people that said, have we not done many wonderful works in your name? Have we not cast out demons? And he's saying, no, get away from me. Now turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13, please. On the screen, I'm going to present it in the New Living Translation. Madison spoke this morning from the Children's International Bible, and I like that too. I don't care what version you read from, but they're all saying approximately the same thing. The reason I chose the New Living Translation is because it is in a more familiar language than uh, the these and thous of the King James that I actually prefer. But it says, if I could speak in all the languages of the earth and of angels, but don't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Stop and think about that. All the languages of the earth? 
I'm going to take a little bit of a sidebar at this time, if you will, because many of the charismatics and Pentecostals will tell us we need to speak in tongues. These are other languages, aren't they? Many of them say it's the language of heaven, which we're talking about in here. If we spoke the language of angels, would not be, that not be the language of heaven? But if we go in this, keep here. If you're going to follow me, fine. If you want to read it on up front, that's fine. But if we go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to who? The Holy Spirit's given to all of us. Not this one and that one and the other one. All of us. Every man. To profit with all. For to one is given the spirit of the word of wisdom to how many? All? Just another. The word of knowledge by the same spirit to the another faith by the same spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit. And verse 10 says, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, and uh, catch this, to how many? Just another. Diverse kinds of tongues, to how many? Another, the interpretation of tongues. Verse 11, but all these worketh that one, sail, uh, one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So we do not see here that every person gets all the gifts, do we? But this is why we have the body of Christ because this person gets one gift, that person gets another gift, yet another gets another gift, and by working together, we can complete the work that God gives us to do. So don't get fooled by these people that say, you have to have this gift or the other. We don't have to. We just need to be filled by the Spirit, and we need to do the one thing that he tells us to do, and that is love. We're going to go back to verse 1 of 1 Corinthians, and it tells us there that it doesn't matter how many languages we speak. I knew of, of, of a man that spoke 13 languages, and that just blew my mind, because I have enough trouble with English. But he knew 13 languages. And it just tells us that we could speak the language of the angels, the language of heaven, but it doesn't matter. We're just merely noisemakers if we don't do it. With what? Love. Verse 2 says, If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be what? Nothing. Nada. Zip. Worthless. The gift of prophecy, that word prophecy is prophetia, and it uh, comes from the New Testament prophecy of 4396 to prediction, to foretell events, divine, speak under inspiration, exercise the prophetic office. Now, that verse tells us that it doesn't matter if we're so close to God, we can prophesy. It doesn't matter if we know all of the things he's planning for the future. It does not matter if we are walking encyclopedias of the knowledge of this world, but it tells us if we don't have love, what? Right back at it again. Nada. Zip. 
We're nothing without love. If I gave everything I have to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. Well, if I sacrificed my body, I don't think I could boast about it much, but that's what the verse says. But if I didn't have, didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Now, give everything to the poor. We live in a society where most families, both parents are working just to make ends meet. Satan has all sorts of temptations out there for us. Every toy imaginable and conceivable, whether electronic gadgets to TV to whatever, and most of us are wrapped up in getting these things. So much so that it shows up in our giving. We have a hard time coming up just with tithes, much less offerings, because we're wrapped up in what Satan's tempting us with. But this says that if I gave everything to the poor, what did Jesus ask of the rich young ruler? Go and sell all that you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. And he wasn't willing to do that because covetousness stood in the way. But if we overcome that covetousness and give it all away, what's going to be the end result if we don't have love? It says there, and even sacrifice my body. Now, can you think about that during the dark ages? People were tortured to give up their faith. They were burned at the stake. What are you willing to give for the Lord? It says if you were willing to go through that pain, if you were willing to go through that suffering and gave your body, if you didn't do it with love, what would be the net result? doesn't count, doesn't count. As I was in my prayer time this morning, the Lord brought me thoughts that all the time I was developing this message hadn't hit me. Are you coming to a realization that you have a need for this love that the Greeks called agape? Yes. Let me take that a step further. We place a lot on our worship of the Sabbath and the other nine commandments. We need these things. That makes us different. This makes us different. This is what we need to be a peculiar people. Amen. A depth of love that this world knows nothing about. Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is a salvational issue. If you don't have love, you have nothing. Amen. Do we need to be changed? Yes. This selfish world-loving person has to be different. And I pray that you will pray for me as I pray for you. Because each and every one of us has to be different. We have to get to this level of love that we're going to take a look at in the following verses. Because this just sets us up for it, doesn't it? Go to verse 4 here. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. Oh, that just rolls off our tongue so easy, doesn't it? But you know, about a quarter of a century ago, I did a project in England, 
And in a Wednesday night prayer meeting, we were talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and the one lady over there said, oh, it's impossible to overcome impatience. Really? Well, I don't know. Just think of all the things Satan throws in front of you to try your patience. You know, long lines. I gotta wait for something? Huh, and then somebody jumps the line in front of you? How about traffic? And then somebody cuts you off. Are you impatient then? You know, our own families. You've spent a hard day at work and you come home and all of a sudden that loved one throws something on you that you didn't expect. You are, are you patient with them? But this says love is patient, doesn't it? Was that lady in England right that impatience can't be overcome? I'm going to suggest to you she forgot one thing. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do a couple things? All. Can I do them? No. He does. Our hand has to be in his, not just during our prayer time in the morning, not just during our devotional, but our hand has to be in his all through the day. Till you're back in bed asleep, we need him to be paramount in our lives. Now, we can see now that patience is paramount in love, isn't it? But it also says kind. Now, let me go back on patience just for a minute here. Who do we love? The, what's that? Everybody. She says, Donna says everybody, okay? That's how, do. how do I, who do I marry? Hopefully the one I love the most. And if she tries my patience in the evening and I erupt to her, can I say that I really love her? I need to pray when I come home from work that I can show her the same love that I, sh that I offered to others during the day. It comes into church too. Do we see impatience ever in the church? If your answer was no, you haven't served on some of the church boards I've been on. But we need it. We need it. You haven't been on committees or done little projects because often we let self get in the way of these things. And I say we dare not do that because we need to love. And we need to even love our strangers. Now wait a second, Brother Tom. I can see my family, I can see church family, but about the strangers? Yeah, even strangers. Why did Jesus give us the parable of the Good Samaritan? He gave us the parable of the Good Samaritan to show us that we should love thy neighbor as thyself. And we are told that we need to be selfless, aren't we? 
Now let's go back to our second point in verse 4. Kind. How can you be kind if you can't be patient? Do the two go together? Merriam-Webster says this, kindness is having or showing a gentle nature and a desire to help others, wanting and liking to do good things and bring happiness to myself, others. We need to be reaching out and helping others. That's what Christians are supposed to be all about. And if we don't have love, we aren't there. And that's why we saw in those first three verses how important this love is. Now, let me skip a couple attributes over here, and we're gonna go to 1 Corinthians 5 because these things tie in with it. Because it says, or rude, it does not demand its own way, is not, what? Does irritability go with impatience? Does in my life, I know. Keeps no record of being wrong. <clears throat> it is possible you could want to be helpful, but just fail when it comes to doing it in love. We see it all the time. I've done it in my own life, where I go to help somebody, but it's not done with agape. It's just done, because I know it's the right thing to do. What about the mother that sees a child struggling with a project? And so instead of going and caring for the child and helping her with a project, just get out of the way, I'll do it myself. I've seen that all over. Don't have patience. Don't have love. Don't have care. You're irritable. All these things tie in together. Is that rude? Absolutely it's rude. If agape is present, then when we reach out to help those little ones, we're going to do it in a manner that glorifies God and sets an example for them. Because for many a child, we are the Jesus that they see. And so it needs to be done in love. One of the other things here is keeps no record of being wronged. You know, in marriages, I've heard jokes made over this. What about the couple that gets together and there's an issue that comes up and they ha start having a, shall we say, discussion over it that gets a little warm and then rather than sticking with that singular issue, the spouse starts bringing up past history. Is that not keeping record? dredging up the past. You think you were wronged? Maybe you were, but we should deal with them issue at a time and then put them aside. I don't know. If you think about this enough, you may think that you need to go to your spouse and apologize for something. I didn't do it, honest. But, but I, think, uh, I think we might have somebody else that needs to do something about that. I hope you're not too distracted by that. Let's bring it back to the church, though, while this is going on here.
That was nice. When we think of this verse, do we think about working together? That's slightly distracting, isn't it? I've got patience, but I don't want to try your patience by just standing up here. Okay? Because we don't know. Let's, uh, is there anyone that has worked on programs here in the church where, I don't know about you, I often feel like I have the answers and that I can help out on almost anything. When we get into projects and we want to help somebody, but if we don't go in there with love, we can step on somebody else's toes. We don't want to be rude. We want to be helpful. But somebody else might have something they want done a little differently. Are we going to be the ones that say, no, it's got to be our way? We have conflicts in the church. And we know, so many people say, well, I don't want to go to church because it's full of hypocrites. You've heard that, haven't you? This is not a place for hypocrites, but it is a place for sinners. This is a hospital for sinners. And it shouldn't be a rest home for the saints. All too often, it's the saints that cause some of the problems. I was in a, in a place one time, a church, where we were having a meeting. There were strangers that were going to be there. We came into the sanctuary after Sabbath school, and one of the visitors was sitting, waiting for the service to start. And one of the lovely old saints walked up, turned to them and said, you're sitting in my pew. And that person got up and left. Love. If that person had love, they wouldn't have done that. We need to think about our actions and how we do things. Now, sometimes we have a tendency to say, well, I did this because they did that. I'm sorry, two wrongs don't make a right. Just because someone else does something that you don't like or approve of doesn't give you the right to go to them outside of love. We need to have love. Is it easy? No, just like that lady said about impatience, it's not easy. But we can only do it if our hands in Christ. And we have to think about Him when we do these things. Think about Luke 23, verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What was happening to Jesus at the time? He was being nailed to the cross. Had he had a bad day? Oh, you bet. He was spit on, a thorn of crowns put on him, beat on him, whipped him. And the last thing was crucifixion. And yet he still had agape. Forgiveness in his heart for those that are torturing him and putting him on the cross. He wasn't rude or irritable. I think I would have been irritable in that point of the day. But he wasn't. And we can do that 
with his power. Now I skipped a couple attributes of love in verse four. We got patient and kind, but we didn't get jealous, boastful, proud. Now when we get to jealousy, there are different definitions of that. And I'm gonna turn back to Merriam Webster for this. It says, intolerant of rivalry or unfaithfulness, disposed to suspect rivalry or unfaithfulness. Most of us think of that type of jealousy when we think of our spouses or loved ones, right? You've heard of people thinking, well, my husband didn't come home as soon as he could. He's probably messing around. It's that green-eyed monster that you've heard talked of in the past, that type of jealousy. And I'll tell you what, it's not healthy. But we see it in the church too. But we generally see that in the hostile toward a rival or one believed to enjoy an advantage. So-and-so got a job that I wanted. Or so-and-so's in charge of this project and I wanted to do that. These things come into our church too. But they're not good because what's it do? It separates, doesn't it? It's, it's always negative, it's divisive, and it destroys harmony. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. This body is a fantastic machine, and this body of Christ should be the same thing. We should be fearfully and, and wonderfully made. We should work in harmony with each other. There should be no place for jealousy in God's church. Why is pride in our list? Let's go back to this. Why is pride in our list? Where'd we first hear of pride? Satan. Satan in heaven. He wanted to be like the Most High. In Isaiah 14, five times, it's I, 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 I. He wants to be just like God. He wants to ascend above God. So is there any reason for it to be on the list? Absolutely. Because you are not gonna be prideful if you have love. There's no room for it. And boasting goes right along with it. Anybody that's boasting, they're talking about who? Me. Look what I did. Well, I'm sorry. What did you do? Did you ever stop and think about that? What did you do? He gave you this body. He gave you this mind. He gave you these hands. He gave you this mouth. Anything that you do is a gift from him. What do I have to be proud over or boast about? Same thing as anything I'd have if I had not love. Zip. Because he is everything. So do we have room for that? No, there's no room for it here. And we need to be cautious about it. You know, inspiration tells us that we should be careful of what we say to our pastor. God gives us the words to speak. So our pastor, or in this case your speaker, is nothing but a vehicle for God to speak through. And so, the pastor should never hear, you did a great job this morning. He should hear, the Holy Spirit spoke to you to me. Because if we tell him that he is doing good, pride can begin to well up in him, thinking that he is doing good. There's no room for pride. 
So we need to be cautious. That's another reason we don't encourage applause in our church. Because we want our young people and anyone who is up here entertaining to have confidence. But we also want them to remember that that talent that they have is a gift from God. And so we need to be cautious on how we handle things like that. All this is necessary. And Paul tells us we need to do what to self daily? Die to self. It's not easy because Satan wants it to come up, doesn't he? He wants it to come up. But we can't have it with these things. Let's move on to 1 Corinthians 13, verse 6. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Truth. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this verse, but I want to talk about truth. Truth should win out. But we live in a period in this earth's history of moral relativism. You can believe what you want to believe. And it's right for you. But that may not be right for me. Because I believe something different. Everybody has an opinion. It's like noses. Everybody's got one. So what is truth? The world doesn't know it. Right there. It's our only source for truth. Inspiration tells us that it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So if we want to make sure that truth wins out, we need to know his word. And we need to be sharing it with others. Because this world's going to pervert it. And, I, and I'm sorry to say that there are many people that are in other denominations that do not believe in the veracity of God's Word. They want to leave out too many other books. We need it all. Everywhere I read in that, I learn a lesson for me. And we have something to stand on. Because if we listen to what the world has, we're going to be taken awry. You know, movies. When I was young, if you went to a movie, there was morality in the world at that time, and you knew the good guy from the bad guy. And you knew the good guy was going to win out. If you go to a movie today, you don't know. They can make the criminal the hero. Is that right? No, it's not right, but it happens. Hollywood's great at twisting things. You know, I was thrilled to hear when the movie Noah was coming out. And then I heard what it was about. It wasn't about anything that was in the Word of God. It was totally perverted because perverse people make these things. And we need to seek truth and follow it. Fortunately, as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, we know that truth is going to win out because we've read the end of the book. And I praise the Lord for giving us that knowledge. Are you here? Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. We're coming in to the time of trouble. This verse is for us entering the time of trouble. We dare not give up on these things. 
We need to have our faith, and we need to have a faith that'll take us through. That Job-like faith we're studying in Sabbath school this quarter, that it doesn't matter what befalls us, he is going to take us through. And why? Because the adversary is there. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 tells us that he is what? He's roaming about looking whom he can devour. And he will devour you as quickly as he devoured Adam and Eve. He wants nothing more than your destruction. So faith is absolutely necessary for this time. That uh, never loses faith. It's worded differently in the King James. It says, believe all things. Do you believe all things? You should believe all things that are based on truth. How many of us have heard a story about someone else? Someone in the church. And all of a sudden, we think, oh, that's horrible. This should be our family. And there's always two sides to every story. When we hear something negative, we should be slow to grasp that and spread it with gossip. We should be willing to give our loved ones the benefit of the doubt and have faith in them. I brought a verse up to you before about love your neighbor as to who? As yourself. Would you like any of your neighbors losing faith in you because they thought something about you? I heard a story once about uh, the head elder of a church being seen in a grocery store and he had pork in his grocery basket. And the dear saint that saw him went and got on the phone immediately afterwards and started spreading the word, Elder so-and-so is eating pork. When instead, Elder so-and-so was at the grocery store because his neighbor had fallen and was injured and couldn't get out and he was doing the shopping for that person. We have to have faith in others. Check things out. Don't jump to conclusions. Have this agape type of love for our brothers and sisters. What's it say? Do you strive for that? Do you strive to think of others the way Jesus thinks of you? I would dare say that the majority of us don't. He went through all those tortures of that day and still prayed for forgiveness for those when he was being crucified. That's the type of mind we should have. No matter what befalls us, we're still going to do for others. Now, 
This next verse, prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. Most theologians attribute that to the time right after Jesus comes. If all of prophecy has been fulfilled, why do we need it anymore? The reality is here. Unknown languages? There aren't going to be any. We're going to be speaking the language of heaven. We're all going to be united in language. There's no longer any need for those. Knowledge? Now wait a second. Why would knowledge go away? Well, it's the knowledge of this world, the limited knowledge. We're still growing and learning things in this world. You know, when I was a boy, the Milky Way had hundreds of thousands of stars in it, you know? Now they say there's over a billion in it. Our knowledge is progressive. And it's progressing at a rapid rate, isn't it? That's why we have all these electronic toys anymore. But this knowledge that's limited by our limited minds will no longer be necessary because this incorruption will have put on, I mean, this corruptible will have put on incorruption. This mortal will have put on immortality. I will have a perfect body and a perfect mind and I won't need the knowledge of this world. I'll have availability of the knowledge of heaven. So all this will go away. And that's brought out more in verse 9. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. This is New Living Testimony. It's a little different than that King James, isn't it? But when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. We'll have no need of them. It's like a child growing up has no need of his tricycle or the little girl will have no need of that little doll anymore. The child, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. We should be grown up. It's time to put away childish things. We're at the beginning of the time of trouble, and there are a lot of people out there that don't know the truths that you and I know. So we need agape. We need to take that knowledge to the world around us. Because right now, we see imperfectly as in a cloudy mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity, all that I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I know everything completely just as God knows me completely. Won't that be a wondrous time? Can you imagine having access to the genius of heaven? Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And when he says the greatest of these is love, can you see why it's so important? Our salvation is dependent upon us responding to his love with that same perfect type of love. Maybe you don't think that this is salvational. Maybe we just want to stay with the Ten Commandments. Oh, well, wait a second. Commandments? How about this one? A new commandment I give unto you, that ye agape one another as I have agape you, that ye also agape one another. That's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. Do you love him? He does so much for me, I cannot help but love him. He blesses me every day of the week. I have to love him. Now you're going to take home with you a meditation on your bulletin. This happens to be one of my favorite uh, favorite quotes from Mrs. White. 
put it up there for you. The children of God are those who are partakers of his nature. It is not earthly rank, nor birth, nor nationality, nor religious privilege, which proves that we are members of the family of God. It is love, a love that embraces all humanity. Now, even sinners whose hearts are not utterly closed to God's Spirit will respond to kindness. While they may give hate for hate, they will also give love for love. But it is only the Spirit of God that gives love for hatred. To be kind to the unthankful and to the evil, to do good hoping for nothing again, is the insignia of the royalty of heaven, the sure token by which the children of the highest reveal their highest state. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 75. I want that insignia. But it's not something that I can just go out and earn. It's something that is achieved by grasping his hand in mine and letting him control this defective mind, letting him put that love that he has in here. Can you look around this sanctuary and say that every face that your eyes fall on, you love with agape? That is his goal for you and me. I'll pray that you can achieve it if you'll pray that I can achieve it.